This is video 8.1 on torque. Torque is a quantity that measures the ability of a force to rotate an object around some axis. So an example, here in an example we have a merry-go-round. I want you to imagine that you've got a merry-go-round and that you pull on the merry-go-round along a radius. If you were to do this, if you were to pull along that radius, you would not get any rotation at all. Now consider this situation. If you pull at least partly perpendicular to the radius or partially tangent to the circle, then you will get some rotation in this second example, B. So in order to create torque, we have to have a force that is at least has, has a component that is perpendicular um, to the radius or tangent to the circle. Um, the lever arm is the distance from the axis of rotation to that line of force. And that lever arm is sometimes called R sine theta. Uh, when we multiply F times R sine theta, then again we get torque. The, um, this funny looking T is actually a Greek letter tau, a lowercase le Greek letter tau, and again that's torque. Um, a positive torque indicates a counterclockwise motion, just like on the unit circle. If you go counterclockwise, that's positive. A negative torque indicates a clockwise motion. And the unit for torque is the Newton meter. This is not a joule. It's a Newton times a meter, and that's because the situation is different than the situation that creates work. This, this situation is always all about rotation. Um, so now what we really have here is we have a third condition for equilibrium. If you recall what we were studying um, earlier in the year, we looked at situations where objects could um, accelerate in a straight line. And in order to accelerate in a straight line, um, they would have a net force on them. So now we see that there are multiple ways that an object can accelerate. It can accelerate in a line, in a linear fashion, or it can rotate. So that's basically what these conditions are saying. Um, an object is said to be in static equilibrium if, it's, if both its velocity and angular velocity are zero or constant. And it has to be in translational equilibrium. That means the net force must be zero. And then also it must be in rotational equilibrium, meaning that the net, the net torque must be zero. And if it meets those two conditions, then we say that the object is in equilibrium. Let's look at this uh, force diagram for a sawhorse. So, looking here at this diagram, if I consider a sawhorse um, with a ladder on top of it, so here's the sawhorses, here's the ladder, and um, I can draw two different kinds of diagrams. I can draw a force diagram, and I can draw a torque diagram. Now for the force diagram, I simply draw the forces where they exist. FA, this upward force, is caused by sawhorse A. FB, this upward force, is caused by sawhorse B. And then FG is the weight of the sawhorse, and that weight is at the center of gravity. So this point right here, that's the center of gravity of the sawhorse. And basically I'm taking the, I'm sorry, the, the ladder. I'm taking the whole ladder and sort of averaging it and saying, hey, the whole ladder basically is acting right there at that center of gravity. With a torque diagram, we, could, we do the same thing. We have to look at the forces, but then we also add, um, now we know we need to include their distance from the axis of rotation. So what I can do when I draw a force, di I'm sorry, a torque diagram, a torque diagram, is I can pick the axis of rotation to be anywhere. And what I usually do is I pick the axis of rotation to be at one of the forces. The reason I do that is that then that torque disappears because if the distance is zero, then F times R is zero. So let's say this dot is the axis of rotation, then I would have a torque due to um, the weight of the ladder, and then I would also have a torque due to this other sawhorse. Um, so next, let's look at some practice problems. And I've just gone ahead and written out the answers here, and I'll kind of talk through them. So number one, 
A force is applied to the end of the lever shown, perpendicular to the lever. Find the force re required to cause rotational equilibrium. Okay, so when I solve a problem like this, what I'd like to do is identify the pivot. And so the pivot is right here. And then I also need to identify the force, which is 15 newtons, and its distance from... Um, from the pivot. And then you'll also notice I need the angle, which is 40 degrees, between F and R. So I'm going to use the formula, which is that torque equals R sine theta. And I have all those values. So F was 15. R was 1.5, and then I've got the sine of 40 degrees. Notice that the sine of 40 degrees would give me this vertical value, this component of the force that is perpendicular to the um, lever. And when I multiply that out, I get 14.5 um, newton meters. So that's, that's how much torque there is. But now the question is, what force is required to create rotational equilibrium? Well, this is, a, um, this is an ambiguous problem because the question is, where? So I'm going to have to make an assumption here. If I, assume that, um, if I assume that the force is going to act at 1.5 meters in the middle here, then the torque needed would be 9.6 because 9.6 times 1.5 is 14.5. Or if the force were acting at the end of the lever, say at 3 meters, then 3 times 4.8 would give me 14.5 newton meters. So in that case, the force would be 4.8 newtons. So again, if, I'm, if the force is out here, it'd be 4.8. And if it's at the center of the rod, the force needed would be 9.6. And your teacher should probably write a less ambiguous problem that doesn't make you ask, well, where? Where, Miss Howell? Okay, um, let's look at another example. Number two, give me a lever long enough and I will move the earth. Suppose you weigh 735 newtons, or 75 kilograms. Suppose the earth weighs 5.87 times 10 to the 25th newtons. If you wanted to lift the earth with a lever arm of one centimeter by standing on the lever, how long would the lever have to be? So um, I've set this up so that the two torques are equal. So we've got a torque on the left here due to the person, 735 newtons. And the distance of the person from the lever is going to be R. And then um, we've got the uh, earth, the mass of the earth, which is the 5.87 times 10 to the 25th. And then the earth's distance to the lever was just 0.01 meters. So I set it up in the formula and I solve for R and I get 7.98 times 10 to the 20th meters, which is a very, very, very long lever. Now, what this person actually said, and it was um, Archimedes, what he actually said was, give me a lever l long enough and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Because um, the, the faulty assumption here is that you can't, you can't use a lever to move the earth in empty space because there's no place to put the pivot. That'll slow you down a little bit. Okay, moving on to our next page. Let's look at some more examples. Explain the design of a door in terms of torque. And then how about the doorknob? So first, we're going to look at these top three pictures. And I want you to imagine that you try to open a door by pushing right near the hinges. And when you push right near the hinges, you have almost no effect on the door because your lever arm, your R, is almost zero. If you were to push in the center of the door, it would be much, much easier to open the door, um, but not as easy as if you push at the end. Here, your lever arm is maximized. It's the biggest it can be. So the doorknob is positioned as far away um, from the hinges in order to maximize the torque because you are maximizing R. This is assuming that the, the force that you exert in all three cases is the same. Uh, here's another scenario. 
what if you ha have a door and you pull on the doorknob and you just pull straight out away from the door? Um, my kids do this sometimes. They'll hang on the doorknob. Well, that's not going to turn the door at all. In order to turn the door, at least some component of your force has to be perpendicular. And, um, and pushing out, straight out from the door, perpendicular to the door would be, would be best. Um, another thing to consider is the, how a doorknob works itself. That we, here we've been looking, in these pictures here, we're just looking at the doors. But think about the doorknob itself. In a round doorknob, a standard doorknob, there is torque. You're exerting torque around the outside of the doorknob, and the radius of the doorknob is your lever arm. In our school, we have lots of these lever-style doorknobs where um, the lever arm is actually larger, and that makes it easier to open the door. Let's look at example five. We've got a 40 kilogram child and a 30 kilogram child sitting on either end of a two meter seesaw. Where along the seesaw should the pivot point be located in order to produce rotational equilibrium? Ignore the mass of the seesaw. Okay, so I've got, first I'm gonna draw a picture. I've got my 40 kilogram kid over here. I've got the seesaw, 35 kilogram kid over here. I'm gonna call the distance on the left X and I'm going to call the distance on the right 2 minus x because the entire length of the seesaw is 2 meters. We've seen this technique before. And then I'm going to use um, equilibrium to solve this. So the torque on the left is the force, which is basically the weight of the kid times the distance to the pivot. And then the same thing on the right. The weight of the kid, which is 30 times 9.81, times the distance to the pivot weight of kid, distance to pivot. And now it's just an algebra problem. Um, I actually went ahead and canceled out the 9.81s because it, it turns out as long as we're all on the same planet, it doesn't matter. So 40x equals 30 minus 2x. I distribute the 30. 40x equals 60 minus 30x. I'm going to add 30x to both sides so that I get 70x equals 60. So x equals 6 sevenths or 0.86 meters from the 40 kilogram child. Um... Question six, a 23 kilogram child now sits 0.2 meters from the 40 kilogram child. So in this scenario, we're actually taking a third child and placing them on the seesaw. And um, their distance, let's see, we found out that X was 0.86. And these kids are 0.2 meters away, which tells me that the distance from this this third kid to the pivot is 0.66 meters. So now to find the net torque, again, I'm going to take the weight times the distance, um, and I get 148.9 newton meters. And the direction of this, adding this kid on the left side, is going to produce a counterclockwise um, torque, which is a positive torque on my diagram. Okay. Um, one more example. Suppose we do not ignore the mass of the seesaw in the torque problem. Um, a 20 kilogram seesaw is 4 meters long. The pivot is 1.5 meters from one end. What is the net torque on the seesaw? So there's a couple of different ways that you can solve this. Um, in this scenario, what I did was I first found the mass. Oops. I found the, um, the mass per meter. So I figured out that the seesaw is five kilograms per meter. And then I figured out that the left side of the seesaw must weigh or have a mass of 7.5 kilograms. And the right side of the seesaw must have a mass of 12.5 kilograms. And then I figured out the net torque by calculating the clockwise torque on the uh, right side and the counterclockwise torque on the left side and I wound up with um, my net torque, which was negative 98 um, newton meters. There's actually a simpler way to solve this, and I'm going to try to do that now. Um, what we can do is, I'll redraw the problem. And the pivot. And... Um, 
the pivot is, it said 1.5 meters from one end, so this is 1.5, okay? And we know that the whole seesaw is four meters long. And now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna boil this down to just one torque, which is one of the things I love about physics is being able to simplify things to their very core. Um, so this teeter-tatter is, um, or seesaw, is a, uh, 20 kilograms and it's four meters long so I've got 20 kilograms times 9.81 really just acting right here at two meters and this distance then would be 0.5 meters away from the pivot. So um, to find the net torque that's really all I need to do is take um, is to pick a pivot find the center of gravity of the whole darn seesaw, and then use the torque equation um, to solve. So I would say that the torque is equal to 20 kilograms times 9.81 um, times 0.5, and then the sine of 90, because this angle between the force and the distance are 90. That's one, so I don't need to worry about that. And lo and behold, my answer is still 98.1 uh, Newton meters. And then, again, it, I would notice here that this is a clockwise torque, which means, did I actually mess up up here? Oh no, that's right. Clockwise is negative. So my final answer is negative 98.1 Newton meters. This is the video for section 8.2 on moment of inertia. Before we talk about moment of inertia, let's go back and review what linear inertia is or just inertia in general. Inertia is related to an object's mass, and it's the tendency of an object to stay at rest. So if an object's at rest and you don't apply a net force to it, it stays at rest. Or that an object could be moving at a constant velocity, and again, unless there's a net force, it will keep moving at that constant velocity. So we studied all of that in um, Unit 4, primarily. Now I want you to consider an object that's rotating. And we're going to be talking about rotational inertia, um, and the sort of official name for that is moment of inertia. So this word moment has to do with rotation. So um, moment of inertia is the tendency of an object to stay at rest, in other words, not rotate, or to maintain constant angular speed, in other words, in other words to keep rotating at the same speed. Um, so let's look at some examples a simple example where we change the moment of inertia of an object. So let's say you take a physics book in your hands like this and hold it down at the bottom and then you try to rotate it back and forth. And then do the same thing but hold the book in the middle. And if you actually have a book handy you can try this. Um, try to rotate the book back and forth. And what you'll notice is it's much more difficult to rotate it in the first example than it is in the second example. So by moving the pivot point, we have changed the moment of inertia of this book. Um, so another way to explain this would be to say when the axis of rotation is in the center, as we have in the bottom picture, the average distance of the mass to the axis is less, thus the, the book rotates easier. So if you look at um, how the mass is distributed around that pivot point, you'll notice that the distance is less in the second diagram. Um, the second um, demonstration we did in class, we had a solid cylinder and a hoop cylinder, and we rolled them down a ramp. And what will happen every single time if you race these two things down a, hap, a ramp, a solid cylinder, like maybe a can of soup, and then a hoop um, is that the solid cylinder will win every single time. 
the solid cylinder will be faster than the hoop. And the reason for this, again, is because of the way that the mass is distributed. Um, in the hoop, the mass is distributed around the outside, and it's harder to turn. Um, so all discs will beat all hoops. So we're going to do some calculations to um, sort of prove this uh, physically. Oops. There we go. So um, let's define moment of inertia. Um, again, the moment of inertia is the measure of resistance of an object to changes in rotational motion. And again, what that means is that if it's at rest, it's going to want to stay at rest. And if it's already rotating, it's wanna, it wants to keep rotating. It's going to take a torque to stop it. That's what's coming next. Moment of inertia is the rotational analog of mass. Well, what the heck does that mean, you may say? Well, if we look at this formula, F net equals... And in my second equation, all of these quantities, torque, moment of inertia, which is I, and angular acceleration, is um, th th they're all rotational values. But what we're going to see is that torque goes with force. Um, we already know that acceleration and angular acceleration are similar to each other, and so that leaves us with moment of inertia being similar to mass. Um, the definition of moment of inertia, if I have just a single point and it's rotating about a pivot, the definition of moment of inertia is mr squared. And if I have more than one object, like I do down here in this diagram, here I've got four objects, all I have to do to determine the moment of inertia is to add up the moment of inertia of all four objects. So... Um, if I've got one blue dot here with mass m, and it's got a distance from the pivot of a, then um, the moment of inertia of just that one blue dot would be ma squared, and for the whole thing, it would just be 4ma squared. Four ma squared. Uh, if we take a look at the second picture where we have um, the same four masses, but now we've moved the pivot, uh, now what happens is the radius for the first two masses is zero, and the radius for the second two masses, these two, is 2a. And so um, the moment of inertia of one of these masses is 2m times 2a in parentheses squared. I'm sorry. There's two of them, that's why I did this. So 2 times m times 2a squared, and when I multiply that out, I get 8ma squared. And what you'll see here is that the moment of inertia for this second scenario is twice as much as for the first one, and that goes along with what we saw with our book example. So when the pivot was in the middle for the book, we had a lower moment of inertia, and when we held the book on one end, we had a higher moment of inertia. Um, in your notes, then, you can look at the, um, a table um, for some simple moments of inertia, and in class we will uh, go through uh, the proofs of several of these which do require calculus. So let's look at an example or two. So in this scenario, it's pretty, uh, does not require calculus. I was going to say pretty simple, but it just, it just doesn't require calculus. We've got uh, two objects, object M over here at zero on a number line, and then object 2M. And the question asks us to find the moment of inertia of the system of spheres.